Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of the book you see here, Optimizing Car Performance Modifications. What I wanna do in today's video is talk about optimizing the intake system to your engine. And I'm talking here primarily about the airbox and the entrance to the airbox. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms, here's a typical under bonnet view, under hood view, engine bay. There's the airbox, it has the filter in it. There's the duct that goes to the throttle body, and somewhere buried under here is the intake to the airbox box. Now let's talk about optimizing each of those different aspects. Here's another view of an intake system, an old one out of the car. That's the intake to the air box. Buried inside the air box is the exit, in this case goes through an airflow meter, and then goes to the throttle body. Now we can make changes to those areas that are typically quite cheap to do, and they are measurably effective on most cars. So let's take a look at what we're trying first to achieve. For the intake to the airbox, so in front of the airbox, we want the mouth of that duct to be located in an area of high aerodynamic pressure. That is, when you are driving forward, the air is building up pressure there, and that helps force air into the engine. Now, it's not like supercharging the engine. The pressures that are available aren't that high, but there is often enough pressure to completely overcome the restriction, for example, of the air filter itself. So you're effectively running without an air filter because that pressure is making up for the pressure drop across the air filter. You can, you can typically achieve that sort of result. So mouth located in an area of high aerodynamic pressure and then the duct that goes from that mouth to the air box basically as large as you can make it. Let's look at each of those ideas. So the mouth needs to be located in an area of high aerodynamic pressure. Here's a photo of an engine bay, an older car, and look where the mouth of the intake system is. It's actually inside the engine bay. That is not an area of high aerodynamic pressure. In fact, typically uh, we want that to be at atmospheric or even below uh, atmospheric pressure in order to force air through the radiator. So having the entrance duct to the engine for its combustion air located in the engine bay is not in an area of high aerodynamic pressure. This is not how you want to do it. So where are the areas of aerodynamic pressure highest on the car? There is what's called the stagnation zone, which is where the air is brought to a complete halt. Now here are some measurements I did on a older Lexus. Look where the highest pressures are. The front vertical surfaces are typically the highest pressures because that's where the air is brought to a halt, what is called the stagnation zone. Now, it's still high pressure in front of the radiator, in front of the headlights, a bit hard to pick up air from in front of the headlights, but it's often easier to pick up combustion air for the engine from in front of the radiator, and that is typically a high pressure area, although not necessarily the highest pressure area. What about picking up air from immediately in front of the windscreen? Well, it's a pressure that's above atmospheric, but it's typically nowhere near as high as on the front of the car. What about from within the wheel arch? Don't do it. Most wheel arches are actually below atmospheric pressure, so they're not helping to force air into the engine. So typically, anywhere across the front of the car where the, the panels are vertical, like the bumper, and if you can't do that, from in front of the radiator. Now, the duct doesn't have to be facing forward even if it's facing sideways, but it's positioned in front of the radiator, it'll be getting helped by that high pressure. Here's an example of how I did it. It's a long time ago now, which explains the awful diagram. This was my five cylinder turbo Audi S4. Buried in here is an oil cooler, and that oil cooler duct uh, d exhausts into the wheel well, and in front of the oil cooler, as we can see here, there's a duct that goes right to the front of the car, to that stagnation zone. Now, you can be confident that Audi was getting good pressure in front of the oil cooler, so what I did is I made a new duct that tapped into that area in front of the oil cooler, same idea as going in front of the radiator, and that new duct went off to the air box. So it was completely hidden, but it was still picking up air from an area of high aerodynamic pressure. What did I do with that earlier car? I showed you an engine earlier where the duct was just positioned in the engine bay. Well, that was actually my little Honda Insight. And here, what I've done is I've extended that duct with a rubber elbow. I've brought it through this plastic panel, which once existed. I've now replaced it with foam, which I've just spray painted black, which is really easy to, to put into position. 
I've got a bell mouth on the front. I'll talk a lot more about bell mouths later on. And you can see it's picking up air from basically in front of the radiator. There's the radiator. So all this area in front of the radiator and the air conditioning condenser as you're driving along is a high pressure area. So I'm picking up air from that zone. That's a good example of how to actually do what I am describing. The second thing is you want the duct from that air pickup to the air box to be effectively as large as possible. You don't want any pressure drop in that. Now, here's an example of a duct that I made for one of my cars. Uh, this is before it was painted, and you can see here it's just been made out of plastic plumbing. The beauty of using plastic PVC or UPVC plumbing is you can heat it and change its shape. And so to get better clearance, I've heated the pipe and wriggled it into place with gloved hands. And you can see little depressions have been made to help that pipe get around the battery. And I've also made some changes here, which are a little bit harder to see. There's a square mouth, and that's actually picking up air from in front of the radiator, as I described earlier. Now, after it's painted, that's the same scene. After it's painted, it's not even distinguishable. So don't be worried by using UPVC pipe. It's not going to look like a plumber's nightmare. And with intake air rushing through that pipe the whole time, you'll find it lives fine, even in a hot engine bay. So the duct to the air box as large as possible. Now, if you're going to make the duct to the air box as large as possible, you are very likely going to need to increase the size of the hole in the air box for that duct to go into. And there's the original duct. Uh, you can see it's quite small in, in cross-sectional area. And that's the one after I have cut and shaped it to take the big circular duct that I showed you a moment ago. So something like twice or even three times the same, uh, the cross-sectional area, it'll flow much, much better. So you want the duct to the air box from the high pressure zone to be as large as you can fit in the car. What about the airbox itself? What do you need for that? Now, often in my cars, I've replaced the airbox with the airbox from another car. Don't have an exposed filter under the bonnet, under the hood in the engine bay. Uh, one, you're picking up hot air, which is bad for performance. It has less oxygen in it, and it's also more likely to cause detonation, which means you've got to pull your timing back, which means, again, you have less power. Um, and you're not going to be picking up air from that high pressure zone. So. You want your airbox to have the largest possible filter area. I'm going to get to that area point in a moment, but to achieve that, you may well have to fit a different airbox from a different car or even fabricate your own airbox. And the exit from the airbox, you want to be as smoothly contoured as possible. A lot of the pressure drop, a lot of the flow restriction across airboxes isn't so much the filter, if the filter is sized appropriately, it's the exit from the airbox where the air can't get out without turbulence, which causes a flow restriction. Let's go back to the largest possible filter area. Now here we've got two filters which aren't very different in the area when you just look down on them from above, but you can see the pleats on this one are much, much deeper than the pleats on this one. And if you rip off the surround and spread the paper out, you'll see that this one's got well over double the filter area of this one. Now notice I'm using paper filters. I have no problems whatsoever with paper filters. If they're sized appropriately, they're excellent at catching dirt. And after all, that's your primary purpose of your filter. And yet they flow very, very well. So you want a filter with the largest possible area and that's area of the paper when it's all been spread out. And you get a good feel for that by looking at this area when you're looking down on the filter and then taking into consideration the actual depth of the pleats. Here's an airbox that I made for one of my cars. It uses a cylindrical filter. And you can imagine if you roll out the paper and then stretch it all out from that cylindrical filter, it's got a very large area. And I wanted to use a cylindrical filter because making a cylindrical airbox is a lot easier in many ways than making a, an airbox that takes a square filter and then has to clamp around that filter. Here, basically, if you use some truck exhaust tube, you've got most of the airbox made before you start. So don't forget cylindrical filters as well. Lots of trucks run big cylindrical filters if you're looking for one that you might be able to fit maybe inside the bumper or, or a place like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the engine bay. Now, what about that smoothly contoured airbox exit? I said there's a lot of flow restriction on many airboxes on the exit. Now here, the whole top lid 
of the airbox is one beautifully smooth contoured airbox exit. And you don't get much better than that. You can see there'd be almost no flow restriction with the air having passed through the filter and then being gathered up and then flowing out of this contoured shape. Now it's pretty unusual though, not many airboxes look like that. So typically what you're actually working on is the duct inside the airbox trying to improve the flow out of it. So here's an example of one that I've done. On the left, we have the standard airbox, and the diameter of that exit was very, very small. It was actually a little bell mouth exit, but it was a very small diameter. And so I removed that and then made this new bell mouth exit. Uh, you can see the pipe goes right through the new pipe, and it's much larger diameter than this particular one. Now, how did I make that bell mouth? I'm going to cover making bell mouths in a moment, but in fact, that was just plastic tube you've PVC pipe again, I heated the end, I forced it down carefully over an inverted curved china bowl and that flared the ends beautifully, a little bit of sanding to shape, a bit of paint and your bill mouth exit has been finished. So you want the best possible flow coming out of the air box and often you can make these sort of changes quite cheaply and quite easily. So how do you make bell mouths? Well I showed you one method then but what about if you want big bell mouths, for example, on the intake to the air box where, where the duct is picking up air, the outside high pressure air? Well, if you're working on a low powered car, have a look at bell mouths from more high powered cars, from the air boxes from those cars, you might be able to adapt it or move it across. That's a really nicely shaped bell mouth. Or here I'm using a subwoofer vent and they've got nicely flared bell mouths as well. And the advantage, and here's one fitted to that airbox I showed you earlier, the one that I fabricated, the advantage of subwoofer bell mouths is they're available up to huge sizes. I just found this one, which is six inches in diameter, 150 millimeters in diameter, and that'll be enough for a lot of power. I'm not suggesting you necessarily have to go this big. It's gonna be very hard to fit it in, especially in a high pressure area at the front of the car, but these things are available. They're relatively cheap, cheap I'm sorry, and they're, they're very well curved and shaped. Another thing, which is from left field, is over the years I've sometimes used these sorts of cake dishes. Uh, if you look on the other side of the cake dish, this one's turned upside down, you'll often find they've got a nice plastic bell mouth. These cake dishes are available very cheaply. You just cut them out, cut out the end, and then you've got your bell mouth. And if you want a really large diameter one, this one's in, in metal, in steel. Uh, here's one, I think they're called for donut cakes or something like that, I'm not a baker. Uh, but you can see you can easily cut that flange out and then weld an extension on and you've got a really outstanding bell mouth for a high powered car. Or you can make your own from aluminium. I cover how to make this in another one of my videos, but it's basically made on a lathe, spinning out that curved shape and starting just with a piece of straight uh, 50 millimeter diameter aluminium uh, tube, a couple of millimeters uh, wall thickness. And I think you could probably use that same approach for bigger diameter ones. But honestly, I think the subwoofer uh, vents or the cake tins are probably a better bet. This one was being welded inside the exit of an intercooler uh, in the end tank, so it had to be made of metal. And look, if you want, you can measure the effectiveness of everything I have been describing. In the book, I actually cover how to measure flow restriction by measuring pressure drops. I typically use a magnahelic gauge like this, but you can make your own water manometer for basically nothing and do this testing. You can actually measure and see if your air exit is improving things. On the uh, air box, you can actually see if you are getting positive pressure in the air box at speed because you're picking up air from an area of high pressure at the front of the car. So you don't have to, but if you want to actually see precisely what you're doing, the tools are available to do that quite cheaply and described in this book, Optimizing Car Performance Modifications. It's out now. Thanks for watching. Bye.